Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll move on then. Uh, Patricia Emma Mian, I believe, is next yeah. and last. Bringing up the rear, but where are you? Are you there? Yeah, we're here. Good. All right. I'm just going to share my screen. Look at that. And I am going to post a link to the presentation in the chat. All right. Who is hello. it? Emma? Yeah, hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Better every minute. It's <laughs> good. <laughs> All right, so my name is Emma, um, and with me I have Patricia and Mean, um, and our project is called Mermask. So a uh, modern museum of audible space uh, is a network of installation art and spaces for artists to create, proposed as an expansion of the public space around New York's shoreline. So we took a standpoint from the evolution of the gallery space based on Brian O'Doherty's idea that the gallery space is not a neutral container, but a historical construct. And furthermore, it's an aesthetic object in and of itself. So first of all, how did we actually arrive at the current white cube? Uh, when public museums began to spring up in the 18th century, people became very concerned with the way in which the art was displayed as well as with the visitor experience. So in this way, the white cube that MoMA is actually responsible for institutionalizing in the 30s was the fruition of a debate that spanned really decades and continents. The white cube is now conceived as a place free of context where time and social space are thought to be excluded from the experience, establishing this kind of crucial dichotomy between what is to be kept outside, the political and the social, and what is inside, which is the value staying of art. But if the art world and the galleries are regarded as spaces of provocation and as a diagnosis device for society, then this sort of threshold starts becoming very questionable. Yeah. Uh, aimed at escaping the ideology of the institutional context and the pressure of the art market, ephemeral and site-specific work became a strategy to break away from the commercial mechanisms. And this type of artistic expression asked very hard for a dissolution of the line between art and life. And it was shifting the focus from the exposed artifacts towards the experience. Uh, so this type of art, installation art, still remains a very popular medium of choice when tackling human sensibilities, and especially with regards to spatial experience. Uh, and this is a uh, highly great by Sassino perfectly capture the way in which uh, the spider can feel when uh, something touch its ribs. From this encounter emerged uh, a spirit where uh, multitudes observe themselves. In the very act of uh, becoming a community engaging in those creative relationships and creative dynamics, the web sometimes can be a musical instrument. It's a way of uh, adjoining to others and will change our new way of living together. And uh, the relationship between sound and architecture can be traced okay. all the way back in history where Pythagoras believe musical harmonies could be applied to geometry. We find similar sentiment in the work of both Vitruvius and uh, Abouti and uh, Ratia Paradio. So the mathematician Ernst Gladney took the first steps towards visualizing, visualizing sound. He kind of demonstrated that the complex patterns of standing wave vibrations can occur in two-dimensional objects. In general, visualizing sound has applications in many areas, from furniture placement in a room to analysis and the science of concert halls. So we kind of looked at projects that evolved from installation art and into architecture while still staying true to the sensory experience. In the Philips Pavilion, created by Sinakis and before Le Corbusier, we kind of saw how a built environment can become fully immersive and with architecture, sound and space amalgamating into one. In a more modern precedent, we see how architecture can capture and represent an abstract sound, like these two projects by Kupimelblau, where one in one music is a very, very clear driver, while in the other, the result of the building changed its environment. Now, coming more to New York and the site, uh, Chelsea has a long tradition of being the arts gallery neighborhood of Manhattan. However, with this contemporary art and the gallery format taking off, uh, Chelsea has been undergoing a very steady gentrification process. So therefore, there is 
uh, at the moment a strong gallery exodus towards Tribeca and important artists and not only are moving there. And this is kind of becoming uh, the new gallery district. Uh, moving on to the piers, in the 1970s and early 80s, the New York piers were the site of much activity amongst artists and an emerging gay culture, and thus became some sort of safe haven. Uh, significant New York-based uh, artists actually explored this dynamic site because they were inspired exactly by this type of mix. Um, the city's Pierre Renaissance, so to say, was propelled by the birth of the Hudson River Park in the early 2000s, and it is very much indicative of the city's desire to reclaim its relationship to water. Um, zooming in even more, we looked at Pier 26 and its new renovation shows the latest efforts towards the waterfront revival by making some sort of dislocated waterfront or shoreline. And we have chosen to build upon that idea and to bridge the gap between Pier 25 and Pier 26. And by combining Chewbacca local music and noise, we compose a specific atmosphere using a frequency information we experiment with generating geometry. Also, researching kinetic design in terms of geometry, due to its dynamic duration of space, giving a new experience for visitors. During into kinetic pattern, we try to better understand the relationship between frequency and topology. Which high frequency having a potential uh, to generate higher around five space, translating this back into a program. So we envision our dislocated shoreline to host three main programs, which spatially will vary between established space and the main one to land towards the more ramified network like space, which is the archipelago. Uh, in residency hosts affordable cohabiting spaces for artists, keeping New York available for a diverse population. This space opens up for social interactions and encourage discourse and cross-disciplinary collaboration. Uh, the adaptable gal galleries hosts the installation art. This space is in es essence constantly reforming and changing public areas. It's where innovation and experimentation can happen through the intersecting paths of strangers while also becoming visible to the public. The last category, creation and research, are studios and workshops, are areas made to conform to the artist's ideas. We have also been working on how to create the sort of new music art experience for visitors and making a mechanical music instrument become an architectural space or some sort of interactive plaza. And by using this public space, supposedly visitors can create music and then they become part of the large instrument that our project sort of proposes. So therefore our project is not only inspired by the frequency patterns and their gradients, but becomes in itself a tool able to manipulate sound. Uh, since we envision the project as a connector, it is important that there is access at multiple levels from a multitude of external areas. So circulation is unfolding both above and underwater level and the linear character of the design is meant to sort of gradually introduce the visitor to a place of sound experimentation and innovation, but most importantly, to a hub for radical thought. We want to make music to create a relationship between architecture, cities, people, community, and environment, collecting public interaction and feeding it back to the building system at that to machine, uh, despite create music art using a hydraulic system, creating an uh, instrument like museum spit. So designed as a public park aimed at street performance and uh, performances, the building invites its audience in through a series of smaller stages. Entering this dynamic chambers of the first set of galleries, the visitor can walk through a series of moving spaces, always changing due to the activation from its, vis its visitors. Um, the formal driver of the, the artist and residence area is based upon frequency patterns. Uh, the idea here is that in addition to a personal living space, the artists have access to private studios where they can carry out their work and research, while the sheltered inner yard typology kind of accommodates an, ex an exchange between the artist and the public. So in this diagram, the space marked as small or ad hoc gallery which uh, we find in other uh, diagrams in our project. 
is envisioned as this sort of impromptu gallery space where the work of the artists or even the work in progress can be introduced to the public without necessarily having to comply with the very rigid and institutional character of the standard gallery space. Uh, the pods can accommodate uh, different scenarios. So for example, on the upper right side, the artist studio is being open to the public and has an auditive connection to the small ad hoc gallery situated underneath at the middle of the pod. And uh, in the lower part, the studio is uh, close to the public. So the artist is sort of just working and not having a very direct uh, interaction with the public. And on the left side, there's a bit of a, an explanation of how we see uh, sound uh, evolving and making relationships between these spaces. The artist studio are created to adapt to user. By, by using a modular system run on uh, the hydraulic core, the studio can expand, contract, and rotate depending on uh, intrusions or insulation being developed. The public pass to ensure transparency and openness to the public realm while obtaining a strong connection to the neighboring peer. The project aims, aims at dissolving this dichotomy between inside and outside and between mainstream public space and the museum space. And therefore we use this sort of inviting atmosphere. We engage it in the process of blending the urban needs with the qualities of highly specialized spaces for music production and research. And this kind of playful approach also extends to the very tectonics of the inside of the spaces and the studios and they employ um, a variety of audible qualities. But I think to show light to modern museum of audible space, a pan on New York in the traffic free public space, celebrating uh, the Shola and its inherent creative, it's opened up an area area unreliable to the general public and celebrated the true human uh, creativity and invention. This, uh, the space sequence uh, uh, in a strong relationship with uh, the water, water scan. They don't only make use of the tidal character of the Hudson in order to produce energy and uh, trigger multiple interactive sound system, but they are also sensitive to uh, spatial quality uh, that water immersion, of course. We envision a building as a kinetic building becoming an instrument of atmosphere next to the group with a space configured by a sound itself. Human occupation becomes a means of which the building uses to share itself and its uh, immediate en environment. The bigger the variation of occupancy, the more dramatic the changes. A space where artists not only controls the medium, but also the space itself and an alternate reality where large-scale architectural manipulation is possible through the unique, unique location of the Hudson. We believe that architecture should be an experience. It should be what you see, feel, hear, and smell based on your surroundings. In the Mermis network, creativity is encouraged, displayed, and accommodated for. Culture has become the common language. It is an interconnected collection of spaces created to support, display, and integrate art and artists into the fast paced and now quite challenging life of the dense city of New York. So I will put on a video, um, but I'll put it on silent. So that is the end of our presentation. Thank you very, very much.
I don't know if it was just my uh, screen, but it was staggering. Is that? That's just screen sharing, unfortunately. Unfortunately, um, but the link to the presentation is shared in the comments, so people can go in and watch the video. There, yeah. All right. Uh, very, very, uh, very compelling projects. Um, I will let the, uh, I'll let the, since I know it a little bit, I'll let the guests uh, speak. Anybody have any remarks up there? Emma, you are reading too fast. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll take that into consideration. Uh, you shouldn't read. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a bad attitude nowadays that everyone is reading. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Can I, can I, can I see the, the, the section again? Because it's a great project. Yeah. My, no, 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 not this one. The, the uh, arti artist space. Yeah, where is it? Where is it? Yeah, wait, 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 yeah. Yeah, this one. I'm wondering why this section looks much more lively than the ground plan. I think because you are, let's say this is free shape because of uh, the, the, the acoustics or whatever, but introducing in this kind of free forms a circle that's the end of a development. This is polycentric, a circle is monocentric. And you can use it in order to make contrast, uh, contrast. But in this case, I think it's not creating the spine, it's kind of blocking the liveliness of the floating space you introduced at this section. Um, nevertheless, it's a great project because what I can see is that um, there are some new shapes and form are coming up and the circles are uh, fundamentalistic language of the uh, metapolis of the 60s. Yeah, get rid of it because, and um, also the, the, the pre, uh, the pre uh, diploma, yeah, this is too, too, too old for the content. If you de develop a new content, you should develop. I know it's hard, it's tough, but this is, that's your task. Not ours. Honey did it already, we did it. Uh, your test is to get a language which refers to an open society on one hand and is the expression of the new technology on the other hand. Um, I have to leave, therefore, can I make a comment? Henny, sure. it's, it's a great studio. I'm really astonished. Uh, Thank you. What, what I'm missing a little bit, what I saw on the AA last week, two weeks ago, that they started to combine analog technique with the digital things. And this is getting interesting, really interesting. Um, maybe this is one thing and um, the topic was great. I appreciate every, every one of these projects in different ways. So, Congratulations, it's a good, it's a, yeah. No, the stu students, uh, students have, have asked, I mean, look, they're struggling in their, in their home confinement because of this COVID thing, but I think the analog, I absolutely agree, the analog digital interface or intersection is really the, the way that yeah, academic in order, research has to in go. In order to find a new language, yeah. yeah? Use yeah. all these things together, not only being bound to a program, but break out. This is maybe it could be a success. Maybe yeah. not. I but, don't know. But, but, it's, it's, but what you're referring to, what you're referring to, and, and I'll just say this to you before you leave, uh, is the fact that, you know, your, your legacy, your work, 
And we we kind of came off of you. I mean, when we formed Essen Toby Zen and I, we were we saw what you had done, and prior to you, other groups had done. And the whole the key thing, I think, is the ability the, the, taking a risk. The risk. Yeah, great. You know, okay. I mean, that's what it's about. And today, I mean. <laughs> yeah. No, and and in today's atmosphere, risk taking seems to be of a, you know it's not thought of in the in the, in the sense of being. Being ready for failure is, is probably more a better way to go than being prepared for success. Um, and, and I think that's that's the key to holding these things together. And I like this project in particular because uh, it, they took a lot of risks here, quite frankly. Um, and you're right. I mean, some of the language is not, not maybe yet completely formed. But, you know, the, these images, especially these last couple of images of this, 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 this place, um, yeah. is, is quite quite powerful in, in many ways, um, and 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 I, I admire the risk that this group took, um, and also Jade as well, and others in the studios. So thank you, Wolf, very much. It's been wonderful having you back yeah. here, and, and I'm I'm really happy you're with us today. It's fantastic. Thank um, you. It was a good okay. experience, and good luck to you all. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll speak soon. Take care, Wolf. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And the rest of uh, anyone else would like to? Yeah, yeah, I, I would. I would like to continue on that because sure. um, it's. Uh, it's. I, I guess I'm also getting more into uh, understanding of those two days of works that we have seen so far, and uh, and getting into like a so, sort of a conclusion. What I'm noticing is that um, this uh, the topic is definitely or the brief is super interesting and it has uh, generated um, uh, quite an amazing outcome. Um, but there's also I, I see this uh, duality of um, the positions that uh, architects are taking. Some are uh, some are taking in the position of uh, curator and the others the cr creator, um, and that's that's something that I that I see where the the projects that we discuss longer are on, maybe that's um, we have discussed both of those actually quite long but uh, in that terms I think um, we should understand that as an architects we are still the creators so it's not only like um, um, creating a shield or creating an envelope uh, uh, surrounding the art um, with the or curating the art together, but it's uh, it's it's a lot about the creativity as well, the artistic creativity of an architect. So uh, we have definitely seen those in uh, in last projects. Uh, so yeah, congratulations. Uh, and but but I would also um, encourage the 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 ones before to to really take um, uh, take this uh, yeah quite of a quite of a jump and risk to towards this um, uh, creative artistic creativity that um, is, is never an easy step to take. And uh, in terms of the Jade projects, but also in this one, I think they could uh, both um, gain a lot from uh, working in a component scale or actually uh, looking into uh, small, uh, smaller enclosures at least I'm not talking about like literally figuring out the detail, but but actually looking at space as a component that that Emma in your project, for example, the sections. Um, I saw that you actually added in one point like some acoustic uh, panels uh, on the walls and uh, on uh, on the floors. Wait, wait oh, sorry, was it in the ceiling and and yeah, exactly here. So. Um, the the panel like these acoustic panels. I, I was really wondering, like, could could architecture already do that, or like, do we do we really need to add those um, additional panels in in a way that um, that actually maybe the uh, the tectonics of 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 this uh, space you have created could could work with it or could be part of it already um so we would have a stronger variability of uh, wall thicknesses etc et so that's that's why i'm also i was really happy with um with element catalog of chase as well so i think there are this high potential where to where to continue and uh, where to grow and develop it uh, further because like understanding the, the components uh, or the chunks of your creation would would make it much um, 
um, much, much readable and uh, and I, I believe a more intelligent uh, space as well. So in in any case, uh, so no, it's, it, it's interesting having you on this review, Sila, because you're 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 one of the graduates who took crazy risks. You took crazy risks in your mm -hmm. thesis. You're now risking uh, a lot in your practice and the way you're working. I mean, you're, it's very admirable your your career trajectory. And and the students should look at the F Re Futures book that we did a few years ago to look at Sila's a thesis project because. It's kind of the ancestor to both these last two projects in a way. Uh, yeah. I, I, sorry to call you an ancestor, but <laughs> but you know the the work that you you're you just such a brilliant thesis, um, it's such a beautiful project, and and you can see it in the book if you haven't seen her work already. Um, and and the attention to um, and, and for you guys moving forward with these projects to the next semester and to thesis ultimately, um, the, the attention to those sections that you did. Um, and, and the way that you approach the language was, was really quite extraordinary and quite beautiful models. Also, to Wolf's point just now about analog, we've been doing that for years. I didn't want to say it while Wolf was on the call, on the on the Zoom, but you know the studio um, over the last few years and even back to to your time, Sila, mm -hmm. has been trying to find a way to merge analog behaviors with digital technique. Um, and this year, because of COVID, because you guys can't build models necessarily or can't work physically, uh, I have to say you've accomplished some pretty amazing things digitally that we a few years ago could only accomplish in, like in your physical models, uh, Sila, uh, which were done in resin and, and all kinds of crazy materials. So I just want to say that uh, and, and thank you yeah. for your comments. But it's important that the students know that you're you're a serious uh, history in this in this projects we're seeing. Go ahead, Lizanne, I think you want to say something. Oh, I just wanted to say, because I, I spoke quite a bit about this project at midterm, so I don't want to repeat myself, but I, I think one of the one of the things about creating a lot is, is also knowing when to edit. I think editing is a crucial component of creating something and knowing when to step back, when to remove so that subtracting from your design or simplifying your design is also, I think, a very productive act. I think you guys are kind of, you overwhelmed us in a way. Um, so I think that your project could just benefit from allowing some of the stronger moments to shine more because there's just, there's so much going on that it almost becomes, you know, too homogeneous with the exception of kind of scale jumps to a certain extent. And I think that there's a lot of different episodic moments architecturally and spatially that um, you might want to allow to exist at another kind of uh, level of hierarchy or, or priority. And, and in that way also, I think you might um, free up a little bit of the site. I mean, Will said something about the ground plane is not as interesting as the section. And I was going to say, well, the problem is, is that there shouldn't really be a ground plane because you're just, you know, you're strung between two peers. And so, you know, how, how do you kind of express that idea of kind of being suspended between two peers, the bottomless quality of your architecture, and then this, you know, fluctuating level of water, I think kind of got lost with, again, like the kind of overwhelming amount of architecture that you've made. So I think that there's and it's completely understandable. I mean, I'm always impressed with how groups of three people working in the circumstances that you're working in can collaborate. And I can imagine that it's, you know, that in and of itself is just a huge design problem, how you collaborate and how you work together. So I don't know how you proceed to uh, thesis from this phase, but, you know, I think, you know, it would have been given more time, it kind of would have been interesting. I don't know how you divided up your work, but to kind of be constantly like passing things on so that uh, through this, uh, you know, every unit gets kind of a pass of the three people that it might achieve some kind of coherence. I feel it's a little bit incoherent in a sense. Too many good ideas maybe, and, and in some respects, some blind spots. Um, I think that the section of the the, I think it's important for the section of the studios to have a kind of malleability inside. I don't know if, you know, you didn't really speak that much about contemporary sound artists, and it might have been interesting to understand the their works more and their methodologies of working. I don't know if you're aware of, for instance, 
um, at the Venice Biennale, I think it was in 2017, the French Pavilion was taken over by two sound artists, one of which was Christian Marclay, and the other was a guy named Xavier something. But essentially, they decided to build a Mertzbau space. And to just, they sort of said, you know, if Schwitters, you know, was interested in music, like what kind of space would he make to experiment music? So they built a space that then they collaborated with for the entire duration of the Biennale, not just the opening week, which was really their intention. So, it, you know, I think that you took an overwhelmingly huge um, uh, program on that doesn't have much precedent. You know, we don't really think about sound that much in terms of space. So I think it's it's great to just look at that, especially as our culture, I think, has become increasingly visual. You know, like uh, we're kind of overwhelmed with images, but at the same time, it's also become very narrow. You know, it's become like the size of the screen of your phone. And to suddenly kind of say we're going to more or less kind of wipe that away and provide you in a space that's going to ignite other senses, I think is really fascinating, really fascinating challenge to take on. That's it. Congratulations. Okay. Terrific. Um, uh, any other, I, one, one disappointment I have in this project, honestly, is, is that I didn't hear a soundtrack to the film. <laughs> this was about to be my comment as well, honey, because <laughs> I was ahead, wondering, yeah. you know, every other animation almost over <laughs> these two days had a sound and it was not about the sound per se. And today we had no sound animation. So there is a sound on it, but I thought we were going to discuss over the video, so okay. I didn't play it. Okay. But the sound generating these artist spaces we see here in the middle, uh, they are actually on the video if you want to see it afterwards. Mm. It is in the presentation. But we didn't play it. Maybe I should have played it. <laughs> if we have 30 seconds, maybe I can wrap up one comment as well. Mm. Is okay? Go ahead, please, please, yeah. please. Yeah, so no, because we're kind of finishing. Take as long right? as you want. Take as long as you want. We are finishing. So it's just somehow it's very nice. Also, um, like uh, Celia already pointed out, you know, to now compare and reflect a bit of like two days of uh, project. And I feel like. Um, of course, given the circumstances that you guys sit in your enclaves and, you know, with without the studio more or less functioning like normal, probably you don't have so much opportunity to see each other working on these projects. But I feel like now there would be such a nice moments where one project can, you know, nurture the other. And looking at uh, this uh, last very, very strong and very um, <clears throat> prolific project, I had to think about yesterday's project about these sensory, sensorial experiences of the body. Um, now, I don't remember names, I'm sorry, but you know, also on the waterfront. And I was wondering, you know, like to learn to take from, for example, from your friends, you know, this idea of um, sensorial, but you have a specific let's say a specific angle to it with the sound. And I feel like with this landscape, with the soundscape that you create, you could maybe even more edit to explore sound with um, through full physicality of bodies, so to say. Not just kind of, you know, the kind of uh, audio experiences we already know, we already listen. Maybe you have that in the project, maybe because, you know, you have so much material, it doesn't come through. But I feel like this... Um, yeah, landscape could benefit a lot of ed editing or revisiting it with understanding of, you know, position in space of listener and performer. And I feel like it could definitely lead you to edit the geometries to, um, to understand what geometry serves for, let's say, formulation of sound and what, uh, like, redirection, bouncing, you know, um, absorbing and so on, and which ones are actually um, having installations, having technology. Um, maybe they're one and the same, but maybe not. And I have to think about the uh, uh, early reference of Bernard Leitner. Maybe you also checked his work. He was an Austrian architect who worked with the sound and produced quite an uh, important scheme of the sound cube. But his idea, and I think one of the rooms is in Technical University in Berlin, his idea was basically that, you know, architecture becomes just infrastructure, basically what is built, 
and the whole spatial experiences are just done by the sound, which are, of course, electronically, you know, kind of controlled. And I feel like this clear understanding or a clear orchestration of that would get you to sort of a bit edit out the geometries and the language that you have. And just to finish with maybe a personal joke from Angewandte, whenever we, when I was a student, whenever we did um, symmetrical building, you know, Zaha would rather freak out on us because she was like, you are lazy people. <laughs> you know, you just want to do half of the building. And I had to constantly think about it because I see how hardworking you are, you know, and it doesn't apply. But there is something problematic in the plan that you show. And I think that answer was I very much like the Lisa Ann observation. There should not be a plan. Maybe that's the problem, you know. And you should not show that symmetrical plan very controlled, you know, because okay. you you know, you should not show the symmetry in a way. So, yeah. so Indra, you and Lisa Ann totally line up on that. You both hate <laughs> symmetry. Lisa Ann also I know is completely I'm kind of, you know, not hating, but I have this little Zaha in voice in me, you know, which is kind of pushing my hand always away. <laughs> if she was on the review to me, she'd be like, honey bunny, what's with all the symmetry? No, it's exactly, true. exactly. So, but th there is some truth for your project that the symmetry not necessary is the strongest part. So, yeah, but congratulations. And to all the students, it's been very interesting that you all found your entry points special entry points. For some, they got lost on the way. So, you know, kind of how to keep that until the end of the project. But it's been very interesting to, to be here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I just want to just to close up also, I just want to uh, reiterate what Wolf had said earlier about um, developing your, your cultural collateral or your stock uh, as a student or as an early graduate or in the early part of your career. Um, what you guys have done, the three of you, which I admire a lot in this project, uh, symmetry aside, soundtrack aside, reading aside, um, what, I, what I really admire is the fact that you three, the three of you have developed an encyclopedic uh, approach to making architecture. It's almost as if you've each gone in as deeply as you can into understanding form making, uh, atmospheric, uh, atmosphere sort of, uh, you know, uh, forming, um, tech, tech, techne, the technique of making architecture, the technique of rendering. And I like that because I think all three of you can, can sort of take off from there with the pieces of the puzzle of the piece that you've already kind of invested in and to Indre's point, affected each other with, um, in terms of, of a kind of a, of an infection, let's say across the, across the, the, the project. So developing an encyclopedic language or world or a lexicon at this stage in the game is really important. And I think the, the important projects for, for the last two days for me are where the students, um, where we see that research taking place, hit or miss on the brief, hit or miss on the outcome. But if there's a real investment in trying to develop language, develop an approach, uh, that'll take you a long way. And I think that uh, you may have to leave it for a while when you graduate. We, we all went through this, um, but it's in there. It's in the synapses. It's in your makeup as a spatialist uh, that, that eventually given the chance to come back or, or grow, it does. And I think that's what I admire and what I look for in, in students' works is not so much whether you met the brief head on, whether or not you did a beautiful set of renderings or whether or not you uh, you know, are, are articulating correctly. It's really to see if there's an investment in in developing language and developing a way of working as an architect. Um, so I want to thank uh, Indra. I want to thank Sila. I want to thank Lizan. You guys are great. It's been a great jury. Um, and Wolf was fantastic. And it was great to have him come come back from the shadows to work with us. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I, if there's any last remarks from any of you, that'd be fine. We've, if otherwise, we'll, we'll leave it here. It's up to you guys. Anything you'd like to just add or subtract or the students want to say something? Um, we no, I, I just, you know, I, I saw a lot of progress since midterm and I think the projects, um, you know, some are more successful than others, but I think that they're all very thoughtful. I can see that, you know, everybody was very committed to their projects and, um, you know, I, there's a lot of hard work in here. And I think, you know, you, you had a great challenge from Hanny. I think the program was incredibly provocative and difficult given not only could you not work in analog ways, but you couldn't travel. 
So it's also interesting. We have to take everything with a grain of salt. I know it's really hard on the Brooklyn Bridge people last time. Hanny kind of told me that was probably too much. <laughs> but you know, you you could only know the site from out from outside in a, in a way, and it's it's interesting to see your interpretations and what you choose to to extract from that. And and then moreover, it's it's been very interesting to see how you've what you've taken from that and transformed it. And if I could add another, can, uh, like a last one, I promise, general comment because I, I mean, I graduated there almost ten years ago or something, and Is and that really ten? No, I've only been here eight years. Okay, so. no, 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 eight years. <laughs> you my first class? No, you were like second or third. Okay, anyway, go ahead. Well, that was your first. That was your first. Oh, you were. <laughs> but um, in any case, I mean, I I see a lot of. Um, uh, I see a certain kind of, um, I, I see a lot of boneless flesh. I mean, that's that's something that I would take from Francis Bacon's uh, painting, but how Deleuze describes this, that you can't really tell where the flesh ends, uh, where the bone starts or where the skin is. So it's, it's all in this, this, this mass, this boneless flesh that you actually believe that it, it is, um, it is somewhat holding its its uh, position, its geometry, its shape. So what I'm what I'm missing a bit aside of the experiments with um, with shape, I, I'm, I'm missing a bit of experiments with structure or structure intelligence that I think in house you have a lot. I mean, again, you have you, you, this is this is I think one of the most important things that I also gained from like this five years of Angewandte that you did you really have to deal with um, with also experimenting with the structure or experimenting with the um, with with the logic how things are or could be maybe potentially um, put together or or actually standing. So if um, yeah, if if you still have time in Nangewand, I would I would really like to push you to take maximum out of those guys there who are the most experimental structural engineers and who are who are actually proposing the, the coolest tools that are out there at the moment to to actually figure out those geometries that you're proposing. So um please uh, please take the maximum out of this because I think Angamanda really has it. Um it really has a potential to design first, calculate later, as uh, Prick said today, uh, but uh, but then really make it work and make it look like a bonus, but flesh. I mean, I want to add to that, and there is a change of guard taking place on the engineering front of the school. Um, so it'll be interesting with a whole new group coming in, I think, slowly but surely as, as Klaus leads. But um, I also want to say on that note that the, that, uh, and again, just, just to, I'm going to try and close up here. The assistants did a brilliant job, and the assistants are part of the resource. And the amazing thing about that school is having great assistants. So I want to thank Jose, Marina, Aldine, Sophie. You guys are absolutely fantastic. And I'm glad that the students listen to them as much as, if not more than me. Um, and and uh, and that uh, you know it's it's a uh, it comes across. You can see it in the work when when the work is proficient. That you guys actually respect the assistants and their, and their positions, and they bring to you things like software and structural logic and programmatic logic and philosophical logic and all the rest. So thanks so much to you guys and, and uh, everybody. Um, and again, critics, Suzanne, Sila, Indre, terrific to have you guys on. I, I hope you can come back. I hope you work. I hope you're not scared away now and won't come to our next time I invite you. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so uh, on that note, thank you to the students. You guys did a brilliant job in the last two days, and also the thesis students last week were fantastic. And yeah, we'll um, we'll see you very soon, hopefully in real space and time at some point. Um, but this is a this is this is you know it's working uh, for whatever that's worth, and it's working quite well. You've done some really beautiful work. Uh, okay.